everyone. My name's Holly and I'm, as many of you know, Australian. And like many Australians, one of my very favourite things to do in England is to wander around complaining vaguely about almost everything, but particularly the climate that you've chosen for yourself. And like the way you complain about having to drive for five hours, which is really no driving at all, and just generally be slightly grumpy about stuff. And I, I try to suppress this urge, but one of the times I find it hardest, one of the times that I most feel like just sitting grumpily and going, this is wrong, you're getting it wrong, is Christmas. Um, Christmas in Australia traditionally obviously looks largely like this. Um, this is not just a Google image search. This is definitely just documentary evidence from my life in the past. <laughs> and Christmas here looks like, like this, like all of the stuff that you've just walked through. And it makes me grumpy and it makes me a bit confused. And because I'm a game designer, one of the ways that I try to understand things when I'm confused is, is through games and through gameplay. So I have this abiding fascination with English Christmas games. The idea that if I understand English Christmas games and, and why you play them and where they come from, then I'll be able to be at peace somehow with, with this wrong Christmas that's all around. So today I'm going to talk about some of the English Christmas games that I've come across over the years of reading about this, and also a couple more that I found out about more recently. Do a sort of a historical overview and see if from that we can pull out some of the threads of, of what it means to have an English Christmas via the games played. So first I want to be very, very clear about what I mean by a Christmas game, which is it's a game that is played almost exclusively at Christmas. I don't mean things like charades, which get played a lot at Christmas, or Monopoly and, and stories of fighting with families. I mean games that happen at Christmas explicitly, that were created for it, and are basically never played outside it. Ah, uh, here we go. And, and the reason that there are so many of these games here that are specifically Christmas games seems to go back historically to this weird hundreds of years of some games being banned except at Christmas and some games being banned only at Christmas. So you had whole periods in the 1300s, 1400s where people were not allowed to gamble except at Christmas they kind of were. Or where you're not allowed to play sports if you're not um, noble, except at Christmas, when you are allowed to play sports, except occasionally then one of the Henrys banned sports specifically on Christmas, but not throughout the rest of the year. But there's this history of hundreds and hundreds of years of the rules about what you're allowed to play at Christmas being very different from the rules around the rest of the year. And you also get things like the, the Lord of Misrule, who was appointed to essentially mess around with the king and make Christmas fun for everyone, wherever the king happened to be at the time, who would dress up in, in fancy clothes filled with the joy of Christmas, as you can see from this guy, and wave big sticks and do things like chivying people out of bed in the morning, saying, no, no, you're not having fun yet, we have to go and have fun, and would just spend the 12 days of, of the Christmas season wandering around forcing people to have a nice time. And we also have games, this is still quite far, far back, this is sort of 1500s, 1600s, called, for example, Hunting the Wren. Now, Hunting the Wren is originally an Irish game, and it looks kind of like this. Um, we can get a closer-up view of these people here. Yeah, this sort of, sort of cut-price Doctor Who monster thing is this game where... Not even a game, more of a, a ceremony where people would dress up, the wren boys would dress up like this. They would get a wren on the end of a stick, originally a living wren that they'd chased down and tied to the stick, or a wren that had died in the course of the wren boys chasing it down. <laughs> and then they'd go around houses and do little performances, and then money would get donated to them or to charity, and you'd just have this quite nice, slightly weird straw head thing and this still happens a little bit still with the the weird straw heads but in 1699 uh, William III I think who was in Kensington Palace at the time decided that he would have a massive month of Christmas games and one of the things that he got was hunting the wren which had heard about vaguely and said oh we can do that but changed it. It wasn't a thing where people necessarily wore big straw bales over their head and went around doing performances. It was just a thing where some boys 
got up in costumes, tied wrens to sticks, and ran around Kensington Gardens, and people chased them. So this transformation of a, a, a traditional performance thing into this running around. And we can pull out some of the threads of that and see that English Christmas games, quite fond of costumes, really fond of long sticks. We also saw the Lord of Misrule with a long stick and also like dead birds. And the dead bird thing is not just hunting the wren, even apart from turkey and all of the traditional Christmas birds, you also get Victorian Christmas cards like, like this one. May yours be a joyful Christmas. A loving Christmas greeting. <laughs> so dead birds, good, we're getting somewhere. There's another game that starts a little bit later called the Bean King or the King of the Beans. And the way this worked is that there would be a cake and the cake would have a bean in it and a pea in it. And you would cut the cake up and if you got the bean in it, you were the king of Christmas for Twelfth Night and everyone had to do what you said. And if you got the pea, you were the queen. This is from a Robert Herrick poem in the 1500s describing how this worked. And there's bits of this that are confusing to me. So there's things saying the man who got the bean would be king and the woman who got the pea would be queen. And it's not clear how you ensured that only men got the bean. There's some descriptions which say that, that if the woman got the bean, she'd get to choose who got to be king and vice versa with the peas. There's some saying if you got the bean, you got to be king regardless of, of gender. And... What happened would be that throughout the, the course of the day, people would celebrate the king, the bean king, as if you really were the king, and do things like yelling out, the king drinks, every time the king drank, and all drank themselves. Um, this little vomiting man down here, you can see, has had slightly too much. And sort of paper crowns that we wear go back to some extent to this tradition of having a crown for the king of beans. There's... Some interesting stuff around this and the English version of it particularly, because this was common all across Europe, but the English version of it from the 1600s onwards took some very particular pathways. So what we've got here is um, Sam Pepys talking about a version of this game where so as not to ruin the cake, they didn't put the bean and the pea in the cake. They just wrote the names on slips of paper. This is 1668, 1669. And it was also written lots of different roles, not just king and queen, but like ministers and king's mistresses and all sorts of other things. And here, interestingly, um, Sam Pepys has pulled out the bit of paper saying queen and just played the queen. So we can see that at least in sort of late 1700s, that was how they dealt with the, but what if, a, what if someone who's the wrong gender pulls out the monarch of the opposite gender? sort of issue and so this English thing of having more roles also goes on to Victorian times when people could buy slips of paper with little caricatures of all of the different ro roles on them and little poems written about their bad personality traits and everyone would pull a little folded piece of paper out of a hat or out of a bowl and then they'd have to pretend to be that person and stay in character until midnight this is sort of the 6th of January dinner time till midnight, 12th night at the end of Christmas. So this thing that exists across Europe, cut a cake, get a bean, be a king, in England becomes very specifically with more role playing and also being slightly mean. All of the poems about the roles that you had were slightly mean poems. This, this caricature here has people looking very irate because they're so cross at the mean poems they've been given. We also have games like Snapdragon, which takes the being slightly mean a little bit further. Snapdragon is a game in which you get a big dish of brandy and you fill it with raisins and then you set fire to the brandy and people take turns to grab a raisin really quickly <laughs> and eat it. As you can see, this child is bad at Snapdragon. <laughs> and these older children are good at Snapdragon. <laughs> I was telling a friend about this, um, James Wallace, who some of you probably know, and he said that this was just a weak version of Snapdragon and that when he was a kid, he had had to play it in an even meaner version where as well as raisins, there were coins in the brandy. And he had to cho choose between whether you wanted to grab a raisin, which you could eat very quickly, or grab a coin, which has been on fire. And then you get to keep sixpence, but also you get your hand burnt. So Snapdragon Fly in Lewis Carroll is a parody of the Snapdragon in this. And you also get it coming up in like, works of Trollope, for example, 
talk about how it's very, very important to play Snapdragon in an entirely dark room because it's way more exciting. The fire is a really important part of it. And that also comes through in a game called Snap Apple, which is a related game where you have a stick and the stick is hanging on a pivot. And on one end you have an apple, and on another hand you have a candle, and then you spin that around and blindfold someone and make them try to eat the apple. <laughs> so this is the time, I guess, when raisins and apples are incredibly exciting to eat. <laughs> and so this is just another description of this twirly stick where people are definitely trying to take a bite of an apple without getting burnt if they can help it. So in these we have fruit, fire, darkness and sadness. We have sad children as another thread running through English Christmas games. We have bullet pudding, which is known about largely through a letter by Jane Austen's niece. And the way bullet pudding works is you have a big pewter dish and you put a big pile of flour in it and you put a bullet on top of that. And then you take turns to get a knife and cut away some flour from the pile. And eventually it collapses. And the person who made it collapse has to pick up the bullet with their teeth and get flour all over their face, which is apparently hilarious. So... <laughs> This is something where you have mess and also failure. This is something that comes up quite regularly. A game that you, nobody wins these games. Someone just fails at them. Someone burns their hand. Someone makes the flower fall over and has to get their ha head covered in, in flower. This theme of most people just escape failure and the game ends when someone really messes up is another consistent thread. We have Hot Cockles, which is a game where someone gets blindfolded and puts their head in someone else's lap, and then everyone takes turns to hit that person, and the, per the person who's blindfolded has to try to guess who is hitting them. <laughs> <laughs> and we have Shooing the Wild Mare, which I couldn't find a photo of, but Shooing the Wild Mare involves suspending a plank from the ceiling, getting someone to stand on the plank with a hammer and sort of bend over to... Ha hammer eight times on all of the different corners of the plank as if you're shoeing a horse while it bucks around wildly. And obviously this is another game which ends when someone fails dramatically and falls off and, and hurts themselves. And it's also a game which requires an incredibly elaborate setup. You have to affix your swinging plank to the actual ceiling and get a hammer. This sort of very elaborate setup is a thing that goes through. So we get costumes and role playing coming up over and over again. And we get pain coming up over and over again. We get games that play until someone fails. We have big sticks, whether that's things people hold or things people wave or things they affix to the ceiling with stuff on fire on either end of them. Get really elaborate preparation. And this is a very specifically English thing. Looking at a lot of the other traditions, this is a list of American Christmas games, which are like... Why not cut out a big green piece of paper and get children to decorate it and pretend it's a tree? <laughs> Why not have a race where you have to carry a hoop while you're running around and occasionally step through the hoop? So this, this thread isn't all Christmas games. So in an attempt to understand England and English Christmas, it's got quite a long way, but I kept coming up against this one game called He Can Do Little That Can't Do This, which is mentioned over and over again, and always with, but we don't have rule, time to explain the rules here, or, but this is an inappropriate book to go into details on this. And I was unable to find anything about what involved, is involved in He Can Do Little That Can't Do This, except this line here. After that, they all sat in a circle and played he can do little that can't do this with a gold-headed cane. So there's the big stick thing. But the squirrel would persist in wrapping the goat's clumsy hind feet each time. This might be a, a role-playing costuming thing. Until the goat protested, well, you can't do this again, and threw the cane away in disgust. <laughs> In conclusion, to help me fully understand and reconcile myself to Christmas here, I encourage you all to attempt to recreate He Can Do Little That Can't Do This. Probably involves a stick, probably involves putting something on fire, might involve like setting an apple on fire on a table, blindfolding people, blindfolding someone else with a stick, and this person with the stick tries to stop the person who's blindfolded from eating the apple. I don't know. But try out whatever your heart says to you. And please let me know. Thank you.